I will now introduce each one of the panelists, uh, starting uh, to my right. Uh, I will keep this introduction short, uh, omitting the many uh, scientific awards, prizes, academy, memberships, and so on, uh, in the interest of time. Uh, first, let me uh, uh, welcome here Patrick Ebischer. Uh, Patrick received an MD and a PhD in neuroscience from the universities of Geneva and Fribourg in Switzerland. He was then a professor uh, of medical sciences at Brown University in Rhode Island. Returned to Switzerland as professor and director of the surgical research division in Gene Therapy Center at the Lausanne uh, University Medical School, and has been president of the EPFL, the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne, since 1999. Patrick. Peter Gruss um, received a PhD in biology uh, from the University of Heidelberg. Uh, was then, uh, after uh, being professor at the University of Heidelberg, became a scientific member of the Max Planck Society and uh, director at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen. And Peter was president of the Max Planck Society from 2002 until, uh, until 2014. <laughs> Olaf Kübler received a PhD in physics from the University of Heidelberg. Um, and uh, became a professor at ETH Zurich, a professor of electrical engineering in 1978, and was president of ETH Zurich from 1997 until 2005. Olaf has been a member of the board of trustees of IST Austria from the very beginning and is also the chairman of the professorial committee of IST Austria. Hem Harari received a PhD from physics, in physics from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem um, and joined uh, the Weizmann Institute of Science in 1967 um, as an associate professor, actually at the age of 26, the youngest ever, I'm told. Uh, became a full professor three years later and was president of the Weizmann Institute from 1988 till 2001. Uh, he has been chairman of the executive committee of the board of trustees of ISD Austria, also from the very beginning in 2006. <laughs> Helga Novotny holds a PhD in sociology from Columbia University and a doctorate in jurisprudence from the University of Vienna. Uh, she is Professor Emerita of Social Studies of Science um, at the ETH Zurich and a founding member of the European Research Council, the ERC. She was also president of the ERC from 2010 until 2013 and is currently chair of the ERA Council Forum Austria. <laughs> Rolf Dieter Heuer. Uh, Rolf received a PhD in physics from the University of Heidelberg. I think this is the third Heidelberg alumni we have here on the panel. Uh, became professor for experimental physics at the University of Hamburg in uh, 1998 and a research director for particle and astroparticle physics at the DAISY laboratory in Hamburg and was director general of CERN in Geneva from 2009 until 2015. He's now president of the German Physical Society. And Jonathan Dorfen received uh, uh, his bachelor from the University of Cape Town and a PhD in uh, particle physics from the University of Cal California at Irvine. He was at Stanford University for 34 years from 1976, where he moved through the ranks to become professor of physics and director of the Stanford Linear Acceler Accelerator Center, or how it's also called in short, SLAC, from 1999 until 2007. And he has been CEO and president of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, OIST, uh, graduate university since 2011. Welcome. I will uh, start the panel by asking each of the participants for uh, their position statement. They were essentially asked the question, which is the question of, of this whole discussion today, what makes a research institution excellent and what does it take to really enter the top ranks of international research institutions? 
And uh, we'll have these position statements in alphabetical order. So please, Patrick. <coughs> First, thank you for your invitation. And uh, I must say that I'm very impressed with what I've seen today. You know, I think you seem to have the answer to what makes a research institution excellent. I think you've shown that in such a small amount of time, you've been able to do wonderful things. So, and maybe for the anecdote, I do remember when Tom, while he was a professor at EPFL, came to my office and told me that he was going to make this in new, you know, join this new institution. I was a bit skeptical at the time, but I must admit uh, I'm very impressed with what has done in such a small amount of time. Now, you know, to go to the broader, why is it so important for Europe to have a top uh, um, research institution? You know, I think we could say that Europe has a couple of, I would say, good brands, but lacks what I would call super brands. So I would put brands, uh, sorry for my, but the Imperial College, the UCL, the ETH, potentially now the PFL, the TUM, and so on. But we're lacking what I call super brands. Super brands are the Oxford, the Oxford, the Cambridge. I think those are the two only European super brands. But they are the Stanford, the MIT, the Caltech. Why is it important? Because they attract the best students and probably the best faculty. It's also important because they create wealth. You know, there wouldn't be any Silicon Valley uh, or any Route 128 if there wouldn't be any, you know, Berkeley, Stanford, or MIT or Harvard. So I think it is important in terms of our economic growth. Now, what is fascinating about the period we're living, I think, is, you know, we see new opportunities. And I think your institution is a very good example. You know, things can go much faster today. It took about 800 years for Oxford and Cambridge to be where they are. Now, what is remarkable, in seven years, you can, you know, build an institution of this caliber. Now, the, the other flip of the coin, you can go down also quickly. And I think in this country, and I have to be careful what I'm saying, but, 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 <laughs> but if you would be there 100 years ago, you would probably put the University of Vienna as one of the top institutions. And it's not the only one. But if you would ask, and if you look at the rankings, you know, Vienna is no more part of this secluded club. And I think you have one, like you, this institution, that rises. So it means that you can rise and fall much faster than before. So that's the first. Now, why is the US so successful, you could say? There are a lot of reasons. You know, I think management, autonomy provided to the institution, the fact that you have private institutions that compete to some extent with the public institution. It doesn't mean that public institutions cannot be competitive. And you have a couple of examples, and I think Berkeley, but they're struggling versus the private institution that have financial means that are not comparable to uh, the public ones. The same, I have to also to be careful what I'm saying about the next one. I think integration of research and education is key. Now, I know that you can have the Max Planck that are very successful, but overall, if I look, for example, the French system, you know, we have the CNRS and the INSERM, but the French university are not. They're mass universities. And I think you need elite universities for a continent, for a region to, to, develop, to become attractive. The other thing, attraction of talents. University is all a question about talents, about the brains that you can attract. In this sense, the U.S., you know, has a, a huge advantage. Attract the best graduate students, but also the young faculty with the tenure tracks, but also leadership position. We tend to forget, you know, people who want to become dean, provost, presidents of institution. Funding, endowment, we don't have to say, you know, the kind of endowment that the Harvard's had with over 30 billion, Overhead on research, which is very important, and that pays, really carries a lot of the cost. And tuition, this is a big debate that you know, is going on today in Europe. So just two words now, and I'll finish there, about you know, my school, EPFL. You know, it was the little sister of another school in, in the Switzerland called ETH. And I do remember, you know, when I started my job, Olaf was president. He was looking a little bit down on us, to be honest. And I think, you know, and I think, you know, it was a good thing. It was a fantastic thing because we had, you know, that you need this kind of institution ahead of you to become competitive. So we had the idea to transform what we thought was a good, maybe a regional engineering school into a world-class technical university. And, you know, we ha I had a very clear thing. I thought, you know, this was, we want to become a key actor when I called the info nano biocognitive convergence, which means convergence between the information, 
technology, nanotechnology, biotechnology, and cognitive science. What you do need to do to this? A couple of things. Attract the best students, teaching language, and I must, you know, this, you don't have undergrad, so it's simpler, but certainly in science and technology today, it's English. Maybe in 50 years it'll be Chinese, but today it's English. Fellowships, attractive campus. You've taken, you know, I think walking around here, you, there is something, you know, you need to do something like this. The brand, certainly, is the number one and probably the most difficult. But today, who knew Google? Who knew Facebook? You have, you know, brands that are created in no time. Question is, can you create them at the university level? Go online. So, for example, for people who have heard, MOOCs, massive open online courses, incredible. You know, today, we have 1.3 million online registration at EPFL. We register every week more students than we have on campus. This will have an impact in education of tomorrow. Attract and keep the best faculty. U.S. returnee, Tom was a very good example. We first recruited from Berkeley. Of course, the Austrians recruited him you know, even further. And I think this is a great thing because this is the tenure track. You did it right. The most important thing is to create. I will not go into I'm sure they won't have time to, but give a chance to young individuals. This is a recipe of the U.S. When our generation went over there, we here we were the assistant professor of the professor. We became independent assistant professor. This is a key thing. The graduate school, you've done it all right. Spouse program, important, you know, uh, uh, two body problems. That means essential if you're to attract. And I do remember when I, Tom, I also took Monica. At the time, she was a key person at Google. So in fact, we were even more excited by her than him. But I think, you know, <laughs> this gives you a good example. Develop a lively campus. So we build a Rolex Learning Center, a couple of things, I will not go into the detail. Sports center, student housing, hotel. That's what is exciting about the campuses in the United States that we often do not have in, in, in Europe. Promote tech transfer, very important. Now you're at the early days, but in 20 years, I'm sure the government will look at this. So to some extent, you have. For example, this year, we've invested 300, you know, 300 million Swiss francs, which is about the same for the euro, was invested on our campus in, in startups. This is important. You need to create. That's what is happening at the Stanfords of the world. And the last two things is, I think, funding. Of course, great people without money cannot go very far. So in this sense, you know, the overhead, which needs to be significant, fundraising, chairs, building, institutes. So, uh, you know, you need to wine and dine a lot, but I think this is important. Public-private partnership for building uh, campuses, and I think you have something of that kind. MOOCs will probably also bring new revenues. And last thing is improve university management. I think we need to have professional. This is a real job. It needs to have scientists, but it's not just something that you do on the side. So you have to have you know, professional deans, presidents, and so on. They have to be credible, but I think this is something very unique. Participative management, I think you have it all right. We love the faculty, but it should not be able to elect the president. I think the president, because then you become, you know, uh, too dependent on your faculty. I think the way you have it as a board of trustees is the right thing to go. And I would say, I'll finish this. You know, all this is nice, but we have new challenges ahead of us. I call it the potential uberification of universities. And I think with open sources, both in research and teaching, we will be challenged in the coming years. So I think at the end, you have to have flexible organization that allows us to compete at the highest level. Thank you. Jonathan, maybe you can uh, share the remarkable story of OIST with us. Well, good evening, uh, Kombamwa. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here uh, this evening to be invited, but also to be able to wish you personally on this 10th anniversary. Perhaps I know some of the trials and tribulations are better than others that go into these early years. What I'm asked to talk about is what makes research institutions excellent. And I won't draw much on OIST, to be yeah. in fact. Perhaps it's self-evident, uh, but nonetheless, it's important to constantly reaffirm that excellence can only be achieved if it is the sole standard to which one aspires for all elements of the university. To set a standard other than excellence is to open up an institution to mediocrity. When I arrived at OIST as the president-elect, there were already 20 PIs working in Okinawa. 
In my first meeting with the PIs, I said that I would, not brook, on, I would brook only one standard at the university, namely excellence. One of the PIs immediately challenged me, saying that to achieve such a lofty expectation was not possible. He could not sign up to such an ethic. I was truly shocked at his attitude and suggested that maybe he should find another institution at which to pursue his science. Setting high standards and refusing to compromise in the face of expediency or stakeholder pressure is a critically important ethic. This is especially true for newly forming institutions like OIST and IST. It cannot creep up on high standards. They must be incorporated from the start. An institution must have a clearly articulated identity, which is usually defined by a set of core values. Standards is clearly one of such core values. For research enterprises, it's particularly in universities, the principle of openness in research is of fundamental importance. This principle guarantees freedom of access by all the public interested persons to the underlying data, the processes, and to the final results, the outcome of research. It prohibits limiting admission and access to researchers on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, or nationality. Along with a clear sense of identity is the requirement to establish and maintain focus. No research institution can be equally outstanding in all the variety of areas of discipline. Overextension dilutes focus, often at the cost of all endeavors. Of equal importance, it was mentioned before, is autonomy of management. Arbitrary external interference and or control can undermine the freedom of decision that is so very critical to discovery-oriented research. Even in the situations where a government, an agency, or a private entity underwrites the research, great care must be taken to avoid excessive and unnecessary controls as a condition of gaining support. By example, OIST Graduate University is supported 95% by government subsidy funds. Nonetheless, the government does not interfere in management decisions like governance, appointments, assignments, salaries, decisions regarding tenure, who or how we recruit students, and the such. We come now to some ingredients for excellence at research institutions. People are the single most precious and irreplaceable ingredient needed for outstanding research institutions. Leaders need to possess vision, integrity, boldness, and worldliness. They need to be respectful and personal, however resolute, but at the same time, highly flexible. My personal view is that leaders of research-intensive universities and research institutes need first to be preeminent researchers who are respected by the, uh, the, for their scholarly and technical abilities. They must be excellent managers, of course, but it is almost impossible to teach a non-technical manager the gut instincts needed to be the head of a research-intensive university. Faculty and or PIs lead the individual research enterprises. They must be chosen with great care. I believe peer review, which is the external to the institution, still remains the best guide to choosing such people. Decisions to fill a slot simply because a lot of effort has been expended to find and evaluate a candidate are not are to be avoided. It is better not to fill a slot than to simply appoint the best available candidate. It goes without saying that overt efforts to exclude gender bias are essential. Left to their own predispositions, bodies that are male-dominated will favor males even when they're not aware of their biases. At the same time, it is not doing females a favor by appointing them significantly above their capabilities. Students are the future and are critical to any successful research enterprise. In choosing students, universities must seek out the most curious, 
independent-minded young minds. Often these talents are masked by imperfect academic records, selections that are based too strongly on book learning and standardized tests will often miss the most innovative of candidates. We live in a highly globalized world. The problems that beset our precious planet need globalized solutions. Our institutions must reflect this reality by drawing leaders, faculty, students, and staff broadly from the international candidate pools. There are untold benefits from attracting a highly international student and employee cohort. The mixing of culture, cultures breeds diversity of behavior and experience, but also greatly enriches the scientific vitality. Mobility is the lifeblood of vitality in research. A constant flow of new talent must be maintained if an institution is to avoid staleness. Of course, a frontier science cannot progress without access to highly advanced modern infrastructure and equipment. Personnel capable of highly building highly innovative new gadgets are essential on a campus. Consider how many discoveries are made possible because of the invention of new experimental techniques. Maintenance and operation costs are often forgotten when the capital investment is made too many of our leading research institutions labor under the disadvantage of outdated infrastructure and equipment that needs updating. The last two ingredients that I wish to mention are, envirom are en environmental and funding. But before I do so, I believe I skipped something. So I need to go back. Unfortunately, did not number my pages. <coughs> Sorry, let me find my way. Okay. Laboratories, classrooms, offices, and workshops define the traditional spaces needed for science. In, the, in of themselves, they are not enough. The manner in which they are laid out, connected, accessible to all, are what makes the total environment work. Proximity of researchers and students of different interests, disciplines, strengths to each other and to each other's key experimental equipment is increasingly important for our science. The geography of a campus matters. Open spaces with attractors like coffee, Blackboards, ease of assembly are important. Sports facilities are important. Spaces that are not protected or defined narrowly by discipline are important. Faculty should not be allowed to fence off their space, their facilities, and people from others around them. Beautiful surroundings breed calmness and creativity. The work environment does count for creativity. Those institutions that are leading research around the world must rail against the increasing constriction of funds for basic research. Too large a fraction of government and industrial funds are going to, direct, to directed research to short-term outcomes. History is an excellent guide in this instance. Innovation and discovery have and will continue to drive the world's econo economies and well-being, and they require long-term investments, investments that are in many cases risky. Responsible management of funds does not require excessive control. Without some free energy, which usually means money, in an institution, research leaders cannot direct support to innovative ideas. Control of funds is increasingly linked to bibliometric measures, many of which have limited, if any, value. Granted, it's hard to attach a coin of realm to research. By the same token, wise leaders and peer reviewers of research know best where the investments will pay off, and they need to feature more strongly in the decisions of our money is assigned. By the same token, 
Universities need to discourage peers from resorting to these kinds of bibliometric measures when evaluating peers. In the end, what counts is the value of their science. My final ingredient for excellence relates to opportunity. Young people must be given the chance to express individuality, creativity, and to develop leadership earlier in their careers. By example, graduate students should be given the expectation that they will choose their thesis topic and then get guided to make their choices successful. Younger faculty need independence from senior faculty. Opportunity relates to the attitude of their supervisors, professors, and most importantly, to the institutions and those that fund them. This is an area where free energy can make a very big difference. If I go back to my own career, it was very important that early on, I got large investments with which to learn. Mentorship also plays a key role. A good and successful mentor is a guide that gives unselfishly of their time, promotes a young person in the mentee's interest, not in the self-interest of a mentor. A good mentor aspires to release their mentee to go on to better accomplishments than they achieved. To achieve breakthrough science requires the largesse of taxpayers and enlightened private, enlightened private investors. To achieve such support is a privilege, not a right. As a community of research and educators, we're obligated to operate our research institutions to the highest standards with transparency and integrity. Anything less can lead to subpar institutions which are difficult to shut down and are thus wasteful of precious money. And you might be wondering, what happened to that PI to challenge my inspiration of excellence for OIST? Well, he left the university by choice soon thereafter. Thank you. Peter. Thank you for having me in this uh, impressive round. Looking back and considering what has happened in the last 10 years, from the inception to the realization of this project, I think Hubert Markel would have been proud today. And it's sad that he cannot be with us. I notice, you know, I can't fail to notice, that if I look in this group around this in the circle, there's a high number of former presidents. <laughs> and I, I wondered why. And I, I was struggling for a while, but then I remembered that we had a person named Paul Baltus. Paul Baltus was one of the leading aging researchers in the Max Planck Society. And he has made a fundamental statement. And that fundamental statement was that in the third stage of our life, and the third stage is running from 60 to 80, give and take. For some, it's more. Your Life is determined by wisdom. So what we lack in dynamics, we may come up with the wisdom, and I think this is a perfectly well justification for the group with former presidents. We are, of course, free, largely free, in our itineraries, uh, to take part. We are also, hopefully, not confined anymore by political pressures and we do not have to take care of uh, you know, certain statements uh, that they may uh, offend uh, the higher level politics, which today at least encourages some provocative statements. And uh, sitting next to Patrick, I remembered one of his provocative statements very well. 
he was very polite when he was looking at me and said he has to be careful in how he will phrase it. <laughs> but he has had uh, ample opportunities to phrase it completely different. <laughs> because what he said was, Max Planck Institutes and, in brackets, other research institutes are the kiss of death of universities. <laughs> so I believe uh, there is no black and white. Uh, there is a justification for all of it, and we may, it's not my main topic here, uh, we may be able to discuss at least some of these components. But today's question is really, what makes an institution excellent? And I think the fundamental question that has to be added is, what makes creative research. I think this is all it is. And it is amazing how easy the answer is to that question and how difficult we find it to uh, address that particular question. And I give you my, uh, say, point of view. Hire the most brilliant minds and give them everything they need to stay brilliant. That's it. It's a very easy recipe. Uh, it's the shortened version of what many study groups have looked at. Historians have looked at. One particular historian I like, uh, Rogers Hollingsworth, and the study uh, creativity, capability, and the conduct of highly innovative research in Europe and the US has come up with a total of six points. I give you the six points. First, excellence in research and leadership. We've heard about that. Second, small research settings. Very important. I come back to this. Third, small group size, large context. Fourth, multidisciplinary contacts. Fifth, independence as early as possible, and sixth, core institutional and flexible funds, not just flexible funds. So let's put a little more substance to these six points. I can expand as long as you wish, but you know, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a, a few key points. Excellence in research and leadership. If you hire people, there shouldn't be a descending order of candidates, like very often universities have to do, because they need to cover a certain area in their teaching. There should be one person only. If you do not get that person, you do a different field. It is critical that you take the best, because the top people attempt to hire top people or even people that are better than themselves, whereas mediocre people hire mediocrity or even worse than mediocrity. So once you are downhill, you are downhill. <laughs> How to get the best? We can talk about this. Uh, I, my personal uh, um, uh, feeling is you have to do Headhunting plus advertisements. Why headhunting? Oh, it's very easy. Because of most of the good people already have a good job. So if you want to lure them here, you have to, make, you have to come up with incentives. We heard a lot of things, dual career. I don't want to repeat this. Uh, the two, you call it a two-body problem. It's all, all, all right. Um, you also have to establish a good balance between tenured and non-tenured. Uh, faculty. Maybe we can get back to this uh, point a little later. Small research settings. Roger Hollingsworth has looked in a historical study, a historical means uh, very recent history, as to what institutions were the most successful in coming up with the top research result, of course, that mostly takes into account also the Nobel Prizes. And he came up with nimble autonomous organizations 
And in his ranking, the most creative were a, a group of 10, like Salk Institute, Rockefeller, and that's why I like him, Max Planck as well. <laughs> and of course, a few others. Small group size, large context. Efficiency studies, not creativity studies, but efficiency studies have shown that the most efficient group size is give and take eight people. If you, I'm, I'm saying this is the average. There are fields, take, uh, you know, the large uh, scale studies in uh, sequencing or um, you know, um, um, uh, areas that need a, a lot of infrastructure, also personnel in infrastructure. I myself had to run an animal facility. You can't get by with eight. But for your own personal research group size, this is an optimal number. The department head, if there is one, uh, has to take into consideration a good ratio between tenured and non-tenured people to maintain flexibility. A vibrant environment, you, I think you made this, and you made this point very well, you need a vibrant, vibrant environment, and if you don't have it, you have to take measures to install it or likewise invite it. This may be something uh, we need to talk about with this location. Multidisciplinary contacts, very critical. We are living in a, in a scientific uh, world with converging technologies. But converging technologies automatically means you have to install interfaces between different disciplines. You have to make people work together, talk together, have a coffee uh, room in which they have to meet. This is the only coffee room there is. This is a critical element to bring together people from the various disciplines. And if I look back, I see Reinhard Jahn here at my own institute, Max Planck for Biophysical Chemistry. There was a medical doctor and a physicist. And these two people have developed the patch clamp technique and uh, got the Nobel Prize, Bert Sackman and Avinea. So this is what it takes. And this institute is well capable of bringing together this type of people. Independence as early as possible. We have many examples where that is shown to be highly successful. The independence, let's say in the UK, in the United States, uh, we have since 1968 what we refer to as the, Indi the Max Planck Independent Research Group. Uh, they all basically follow the same uh, protocol, or uh, if, I, if I look at Helga Novotny, I, 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 I of course have to mention ERC fellowships. These are all very important instruments to give young people stability for a certain period of time to let them an unfold their creativity. You need to coach young people. You need to make hard decisions. You have to tell a person that science or research is not for you if you want to be uh, making a career. This is a very hard decision. And the longer you postpone it, the more problematic this decision is going to be. So you have to establish a coaching structure. And finally, a very important point from my uh, perspective, core institutional and flexible, flexible external funds. So I always like to call it you need a good balance between a high trust and a low trust funding system. The low trust funding system is all third party funds. NIH funding uh, in Germany, DFG funding. So low trust, why? Because the funding organization can change the direction they want to fund readily. Within a couple of years, they can redirect the research. This is low trust. But this is not sufficient for a very simple reason, because the uh, process that lies behind it is a process of peer review. Peer review means 
your application is being sent to your competitors, and they will definitely say that this project is too risky or too boring. So you can, in, in many cases, do creative research only if you hide it, right? And this is a problem in the United States, for example. They hide it. They basically have done the experiment already and then apply for it. So uh, the best balance is indeed low trust and high trust. High trust, looking at the uh, politicians, uh, high trust means you have to trust the institution you fund. Give them the money that you can afford and let the institute run the high trust funding within the institute. I think this is the, the gist of uh, uh, what I uh, wanted to say and uh, I'm looking forward to discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Rolf, please. Well, you, you were advertising small groups. Unfortunately, I'm coming from a research area where the groups are relatively large. And they also do excellent science. But that's maybe in between us two. Okay. So thank you for inviting me. <laughs> okay. Thanks, thank you for this invitation. It was my first uh, visit to the IST. It was short up to now, but I can tell you it's impressive. You are on a very, you are on a fantastic path and you are already pretty excellent. So, happy birthday to you. It's a fantastic institute. I want to give it now in my short speech a sort of different angle, a different touch. I want to remind you on the mission of research institutions. What is the mission of research institutions? First of all, of course, it's research, that the raison d'etre. You want to push back the frontiers of knowledge. That's clear, that's number one. But you need to do that, in order to do that, you need innovation, innovative technologies. You have to develop new cutting edge technologies in order to perform your, uh, your research. And you need educated and trained scientists and engineers. So you need education and training of scientists and engineers of tomorrow. That's very, very important. And last but not least, you should not forget outreach. You have to take the society with you. It's very important uh, to promote science and society. If I take all these four, these four areas, then I would say for an excellent institutions, institution, excellent Excellence is required in all these areas. For research, of course, you need convincing science cases. That's clear. You need a clear vision. But this science case, this vision has to be continuously developed, otherwise you have stagnation. You have to continuously develop it, improve it, adapt it. This research now will, of course, drive innovation. And with this innovation, you drive innovative technologies, you get a fantastic partnership with industry, and you, have you are starting now with a, with a new campus here for uh, uh, spin-off companies. And, but these innovative technologies then in turn drive again the research. So you have this virtuous circle where research drives innovation, drives technology, drives research. And if people are asking why I took it, 50, nearly 50 years to discover the famous Higgs boson. Why, took it why did it take 100 years to find the gravitational waves? Because the technologies were not there. They had to be developed. And the research itself drove these technologies. So if you break this circle, you lose. So every excellent institution must keep this virtuous circle alive. So that's another message. So that research results in technology transfer, but more important for me than technology transfer is knowledge transfer. And it's the people. We were all talking about the people. Education and training. And world-class excellent institutions need excellent staff on all levels. We should not forget on all levels. It's not only the, it's, it's all the supporting staff, everybody. And 
they need intellectual challenges. And these intellectual challenges, they are, need to be there for all types of staff, otherwise, again, you have stagnation. And as I already said, outreach to all levels of society is needed and has to be inspirational. Otherwise, your core funding or the other funding might break away. So excellence can be in individuals. I think everybody agrees on that. But to my mind, excellence can also be in cooperation. Cooperation with partners, partner institutes. You cannot do things alone. You need partner institutes, laboratories, universities. You need the industry as partners. And you should look beyond your borders, beyond your boundaries. It has to be national and international. Today's world is global. And the people have to learn that. We need to work together in a complementary way. Excellence is not only competition. Excellence is also cooperation. And both of them are vital for excellence. And excellence is not necessarily unique. It is really also in the cooperation. Cooperation promotes excellence. So give me, let me give an example of, at CERN. When we had, in 2008, the LHC broken, we got immediately help from our partner laboratory in the US from Fermilab, they had at that time the strongest, the best uh, accelerator, but they didn't hesitate to help us. We were competing, but we were also cooperating. And I think this is what brings science forward and what brings excellent science forward. Excellence also means that you attack scientific questions which might not give the expected output. So you have to allow for failure. You have to allow for some research which takes some risk and which might fail in the result which it was aiming to achieve. And that's fine. Then you are doing really science at the edge. And I think this is something which is missing today sometimes in, in, in very often in the countries in the support of science. I want to have a guaranteed output, a guaranteed return, a guaranteed output. You cannot guarantee it when you are doing basic science. What you can guarantee is that the path towards achieving the result is right, is good. But this is also a message. Please take also science which might fail in the result on board, at least some of it. So, my summary would be Excellence needs clear visions in all aspects of the institution. Research, innovation, education, outreach. You have to be leading edge, take some risk. You have to be attractive and inspirational. You have to get the best people, you have to get the best leadership. Think strategically, change your directions if needed, and think long term. Support the virtuous circle. If excellent institutions don't do it, we are losing out. Cooperation and competition provide excellence. So I would like the word cooperation, cooperation and competition, cooperation. Allow for failure, take some risk, and finally, integrate science into society. Be a beacon for that. Thank you. This works, okay. So, um, after 10 years of depositing the report, I suppose the question has shifted a little bit. Uh, the question is, initially was how to make an excellent research institute. Today we are talking about what makes a research institute excellent. And I suppose the many of the things uh, which help to make an excellent research institute persist and help in making, uh, keeping it excellent or always enhancing excellency. Now, I was in a situation uh, in 2006 where National University of Singapore, who had made a decision quite similar to Patrick's decision, that they wanted to become an excellent university 
the traveling in the, I would say, in the style of the Meiji Commission, traveling around the world, looking at other places that uh, have a reputation of being excellent, and trying to really find out how, what do we have to do, how can we make our university excellent. Uh, the recipe which came out is, is very simple and it's been alluded to a few times. Actually, I used it in 2012 in the annual report. The strategy to create a top research institution sounds deceptively simple. Search, appoint and retain world leaders from research, all else will follow. Now, the all else which follows, of course, are governance issues and these governance issues have been uh, touched uh, in the panel many times, so I don't want to repeat it. Uh, today, I think we all know uh, what makes an excellent institution. Uh, not all of us can do it. Uh, but uh, if you have the money, given the money, I mean, this is what, what, of course, Patrick has shown. This is, I think, what NUS has shown, what NTU is showing these days, is that given the money, you can do it. The money alone, of course, does not suffice. I'm not sure that King Abdullah University of Science and Technology has a chance of making it, but this touches upon one aspect which I would like to amplify, maybe the difference between a university and a research institute. A research institute can be built on the moon. I mean, you just have to get the right people there and, and give them an atmosphere and the resources, and they can do, uh, they can do research. A university, in my mind, is very much a part of society. So whenever I see a university like the Bundes Universität der Bundeswehr or, or King Abdullah University with a big fence around it and the elaborate security, uh, elaborate security provisions, I get mad. I say, this is not a university. This is a, a correctional facility or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I said, when you, when you go to Singapore and see what Yale and US looks like, I mean, they are so obsessed with security and safety that they put big gates around, automatic gates, which go clonk, clonk when they close. And to me, this actually reminds me of <laughs> a correctional facility, the Umschluss. Um, but I did want to stay there. Um, so, a university is part of society, and I think it's depending a lot on the habitat, on, on the environment where, where, it, where it sits. And also, I suppose, one has to differentiate a little bit, and here is, I think, where we have to discuss within IST Austria. Uh, a university, the fame and shame, the reputation of university, in my mind, is first and foremost made by the people who leave the university. Graduates, assistant professors, uh, PhDs and, and so on. When you look at the US World and News Report ranking, what do they do? They simply ask employers from which university do you like to hire your, your new employees, which gives a pretty good ranking of uh, educational institutions, I think. Now, being an educational institution uh, means that you are responsible for future generations in particular, and you feel it every day. It's, it's very direct. It's not indirect. So being responsible for future generation means you have always to think about the future uh, and always to look at what the future could be like. So the things a research institute has to do which aspires to world leadership, but also which a university has to do, which wants to be a leading research university, is first off, number one, to make contributions, significant contributions, uh, to global, to themes of global importance. Point number two is to identify and to develop new themes of global importance. And number three is a very practical thing that, of course, you have to harmonize your portfolio with your stakeholders and with your funders. If you do things which, uh, whose utility to society or the, the guys who fund you, you cannot demonstrate, you will have a hard time in the long run. Now, the second point to me is very important. Who's better situated to identify and develop new themes which may acquire global importance. And here is where I believe um, 
the drive that the young provide in a university and, of course, the demands they have to us can be a very good mo engine to really make the faculty, make the university administration look out and see where are there themes of global importance which are emerging, which we should pick up and try and develop if we can do so at home. A research institution, in particular one which does excellent research in the areas where it is prominent, uh, and we can debate this, of course. <laughs> uh, we may debate this. Um, maybe it maybe lacks this motivation to some, some extent, and uh, maybe a university... Um, let me make this strong statement in the, in the long run. Maybe a university actually is more flexible than a research institute. But uh, this is something that we can discuss at length. Uh, okay, that's about it. <laughs> being being the, the last in this illustrious round here, Almost everything has been said, but I will make five points, and I hope I can highlight things that have not been said, or at least not in the way how I would like to say it. The first point is I want to go back to what Haim reminded us initially, namely that there is no straight line, no straight blueprint how to build a research institution of excellence. There are unexpected obstacles, there are detours, and even if you have a great blueprint, a model, as the Weizmann Institute is a model, it does not mean that you can simply transfer it and put it into a context, as we find out was the case here in Austria. And this um, reminder of the difficulties, the unexpectedness in building an institution is mirrored in what happens inside an excellent institution. Namely, it's the radical openness of science towards the future. There are preset directions, there are interesting research questions that are being pursued, but pushing further into the unknown means you do not know the outcome when you start. And to provide the kind of overall setting and to nurture the kind of openness towards the future. I think this is, for me, the essence of what makes a research institution excellent and great. Now, how do you do this? And you have heard from all of us here, the emphasis is on young people. What else? The young people represent the future of scientific developments. We try to give them the best education, training, etc. Nevertheless, um, looking for excellent young people means, in my opinion, to look for a quality that I would like to call competent rebels. I would like to see young people who are rebels in the sense that they question the received wisdom and scientific knowledge is always preliminary certain knowledge. It will be replaced, it will be expanded, it will be complemented by new knowledge that will be produced. And this kind of uh, rebelliousness is part of what we should look for. At the same time, it's necessary to have competence. Therefore, competent rebels would be what I would suggest that we look for. And excellence, and this is just a reminder, is always a multi-dimensional concept. Once you reduce it to a one-dimensional concept, you get the kind of indicators, you get the kind of measurements that can only represent one dimension, but not the dynamic and multiple dimensions that excellence that keeps continuing to evolve. It's not set once and for all what excellent means. And um, therefore, <clears throat> this um, competent rubbers captures this. The third point, you need to provide, obviously, the best working conditions possible. And working conditions have um, a space component, and they have a temporal component. 
Space component means you provide them with a nice working environment, the facilities are there, the campus is beautiful, etc. But it also means the space to communicate with others, to make it almost obligatory from an architectural point of view and from a social organizational point of view, that you have to run into each other that you start discussing things that you have not intended to discuss with people you meet. And again, this is the unexpected that comes in, in the kind of personal encounters. Science is an oral culture, in the way how anthropologists are describing oral cultures. In the sense, you need to talk to each other. Ideas come about, they emerge by talking to each other. And the temple dimension is equally important. And by this I mean to leave also time for the unexpected, the unforeseen. What um, was once called um, day science and night science. Night science is the difficult process, the, frustra the frustration when an experiment does not work, when you end up in a blind alley, you have to start again, and day science, in the end, is the end, the end of the tunnel. But to provide time to let also night science take its course, to allow serendipity, this very powerful alley of every research and every scientific work, serendipity meaning you come across, you encounter, you find a phenomenon that you have not been looking for, but, and this is the second important uh, side to it, you recognize its significance. And this needs a very special temporal arrangement in which this can happen. My fourth point um, also comes in in the second part when you said building an institution and running an institution. There is a life course to every institution. Seven years is a wonderful age. The crisis come, in, this is my, not empirically founded, but my observation, the life, midlife crisis comes when an institution is 20 years old. And it repeats itself when it's 40, if it has survived. So seven years is a wonderful age in which you can still try out many, many things, and if you do it well, it will help you set the path so that you reach your 20s with a lot of path dependency behind you and the Matthew principle is working in your favor. My last point um, relates to the fact that we are here in Austria. And this is important because uh, this institution here for me represents the openness of Austria towards the world. It has opened up a window which is quite a unique window to look at this vast scientific, global scientific landscape that we now have. We are a tiny spot on this global scientific landscape. Nevertheless, it's one that is very attractive and I wish you and us all that the attractiveness may continue to increase. Thank you. Thank you. So I will now skip Heim, but uh, don't worry. <laughs> Heim will get the closing statement. Um, I want to get back to Jonathan and not let you get away entirely without talking a bit about OIST. Uh, We've just heard, actually, for the second time now, that there's not one way to achieve excellence. If one looks at the stories of OIST and ISD, one starts to wonder. Uh, because for those of who you don't know, there's not, don't, not only name are these institutions remarkably similar, but also in, in age and in organization and in many of the key decisions that have been made at the very beginning, like tenure track, graduate school, interdisciplinary rotation system and so on, down to remarkable details, and this completely independently of each other. We had no idea that OIST exists uh, seven years ago, and probably 
the opposite was true as well. So how do you explain this? Well, I think it would be self-righteous and arrogant to suggest there's only one way to achieve an outcome. So of course you're right. However, opportunity is driven by dynamics and landscape changes. And these, of course, happen in the areas of research and education. Uh, adapting success to new opportunity and to new landscapes uh, is an important process that we go through. And I think that there was a confluence that happened around the end of 2000 and the, the beginning of the 2000s uh, that uh, led to the strong overlap between the drivers of, uh, of uh, these two universities. And, and then I think the responses were relatively self-evident. So universities, of course, are about creating new knowledge. There's nothing new about that. It's been true since time immemorial. However, the universities have to operate in a very different world than they did uh, back in the Middle Ages or since then. So I think that the observations maybe that were led to, to the kinds of outcomes that we have at these two universities were first to notice that undergraduate education in the 90s changed radically. Uh, the, the way undergraduates studied changed a lot. A significant uh, part of the university process became uh, at distance learning, distance through MOOCs, less contact between professors and students, and a uh, significant uh, use of, of the uh, electronic media. And I think what's important is that if you want to train research scientists, that doesn't work. And therefore, this emphasis on a graduate university only that preserves the environment for tutelage, for <coughs> exploration, for independence of young people, but embedded in, a, uh, in an environment that can keep them at least from falling over the edge, even if it takes them to the edge of knowledge. Uh, is one of the commonalities. Uh, inherent in that is the, is the common theme of, uh, if you don't give young people the opportunity to uh, discover for themselves, they won't make the mistakes, they won't go down those routes which need to be gone down in order to know how to actually get that path that leads you to the outcome. So I think the change in undergraduate education uh, made people recognize that they needed to protect the graduate experience, particularly for science. Uh, another very common uh, observation, I think, was a common observation between the two forefathers was uh, the fact that the great research universities in the, in the 90s were looking for, increasingly looking for ways to do interdisciplinary research. It became very clear through the 80s and the 90s that we weren't going to solve all the challenging problems simply within a discipline. The brain is the standard example. And neuroscientists won't solve that problem in of themselves. They need people who are physicists, chemists, computer scientists, etc. It's a highly, highly complex problem. And seeking to set up an environment that promoted that opportunity for interdisciplinarity drove much of the decision making about these universities, the way they're laid out, uh, the way uh, there are absence of concentrations uh, of various uh, departments, et cetera. Uh, and finally, I think it was a, a recognition that internationality is, is critically important. Uh, now, it was just said that uh, this is a portal for Austria for the rest of the world. Uh, OIST is exactly that. It is the only English-speaking university in Japan. Japan is a difficult place to break into for foreign researchers. OIST provides a very natural portal for that, and we're finding that's really true. So the, the notion uh, stressed by Ralph and others that uh, you need uh, to aggregate the, the talents of the international community increasingly to achieve research outcomes, I think is another strong uh, overlap uh, that set the tone for these two universities. Okay. That would be my maybe last less than short answer. 
Thank you, yeah. In the interest of time, let me actually say that it's okay to give short answers. <laughs> <laughs> that means I was too long. <laughs> uh, Helga, OIST and ISD are not the only institutions that are approximately 10 years old. Uh, there's also the European Research Council. Again, I very much doubt, actually, that in this founding story of IST, anybody had the foresight and the knowledge about the IST and the foresight, uh, about the ERC and the foresight about what it would become for Europe. <clears throat> Yet, it's almost inconceivable that ISD could have been as successful as it has been without the existence of the ERC. Uh, in fact, one could turn it even around if anybody had sort of uh, had sort of uh, really the clairvoyance to to predict what would happen to the ERC and had said Austria must start an in institution to take maximal advantage of the existence of the ERC. Would something like ISD have been exactly the answer to this? Well, you know, timing is very very important. And uh, looking back at 2007, and indeed we started officially 2007 or so, also the main work was done 2006 in preparation, and the idea of course uh, reached back before. You could say, um, East Austria and ESC are a match made in the EU funding heaven. <laughs> but, but, there is a precondition to that, and I think it is worthwhile just to reflect for a short moment what is it that brought about this radical policy change in EU funding policy. Before the ERC existed, funding basically was done to increase the competitiveness of European industry. And basic research was relegated, officially it was not allowed. It was relegated to the various programs, for instance, in the life sciences, it had become impossible to distinguish this is fundamental research, this is applied research. So it entered through the back door, but officially it did not exist. So what brought about this radical <coughs> policy change? And I think although the scientific community would like to hear that it was their lobbying for the ESC, and this has a long history, I'm sorry I have to disappoint you. It was not just the lobbying of the scientific community. It was the realization at the very top that Europe is entering a new phase. And the new phase had to do with the National, the denationalization of European industry that now had to compete on the world market and the weakness of European universities to do enough excellent basic research. So from this point of view, I think there is indeed in this kind of mega picture a convergence of realizing that if you want European industry to succeed, Europe has to nurture much better its fundamental research, but leaving it the space, giving it the conditions in terms of bottom-up, no thematic priority, everything the ESC stands for and that you stand for, as the precondition of having the kind of excellent fundamental research that will eventually, and I'm back to the long time perspective, fundamental research, you cannot tell the outcome in the beginning. You don't know when and what you will achieve. The only thing uh, that we can say, looking back at almost 400 years of history of science, we will achieve amazing things. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe Patrick, if I... Yeah. I, I think you said during um, uh, your statement that EPFL basically uh, made it fr uh, from an, an, it was something like a regional engineering school to one of, I think, 
undisputedly to one of continental Europe's very top universities in the remarkable span of really 15 years. Now, everybody tells me, you know, you cannot build a scientific, uh, or a, you know, reputation in years. You need decades for that. So how did you really do it? What was, what was the key? I don't know if there's a recipe uh, about it, but I think, you know, we started, even though we didn't start from scratch. Okay. Now, uh, you know, it has a good base, but certainly not the ambition. Now, sometimes it's more difficult to do some re-engineering, you know, institution than to start from scratch. So to be honest, the start, and Olaf, you know, remembers probably, it was a very hard, you know, and I could, we could have never made this if the governance, you know, didn't help us. So, so because, you know, just we closed 13 departments, which is not the most popular thing to do. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we put a huge pressure on the faculty. Uh, so there's a lot of things. And we started this 10-year track, which I think was the most important thing. Uh, uh, to do, and, and we launched the graduate school. So those are fundamentals we spoke, all of us. The question is, you know, the recipe is easy, is how to implement. And I think the governance, you know, of the ETH domain allows you to do it. I always said I would have never been elected, certainly not after the first years or two. <laughs> uh, 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 and now I pretend that I would have maybe a chance to be elected. <laughs> so it's time to leave. Uh, um, so, but, but I think th this is extremely important that you, you have, you know, the authority at least at the start. Because quality, you know, when you have people of not even quality, somebody has to, 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 to tell them pretty blunt, bluntly. Um, and, and that is not an easy thing to do. So we were in, the thir in our 30 years, so the tough years, the midlife crisis, <laughs> to some extent, and the people were not hired with this ambition. So we came as a second generation to some extent. We had gone to the top schools in the US, you know, the, the, the few Swiss in the institution, <laughs> and, and we had a clear idea. And the idea, which I think you're trying to do also here, was to try to take the best of the US system, which is, you know, give independence, the graduate school, but also the best of Europe, because there are also good things about Europe. And I think what you said about the funding is very important. You know, this mix of basic funding that allows you to do very disruptive things, plus the competitiveness on top of that to go and to show, in fact, your competence of, of competing in this world. So to some extent, we came at the ideal time, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, and also, we were held by a lot of things. You know, the, the Geneva Lake is not a bad place to live, which is not, a, you know, an important. The campus, we were able to change it and, and, and make it quite attractive. So it's a whole set of things. And I think we knew, our generation knew how. We knew a lot of us were in the United States. You know, we loved it, but we, we were never passionate by baseball. Neither did we want to retire in, in Florida. So we prepare, you know, we prefer the market, the opera, the, the kind of lifestyle that we like about Europe. But, but with this kind of, you know, get-going attitude of the U.S., this competitiveness. And I think that's what the recipe for Europe is to mix and, and, and to take the best of both worlds. That was, and the other thing we were held because we had an inside challenger, you know, that, that we could see and we thought, you know, that we could get there. I do remember Olaf told me that it would take 50 years to recruit the same quality as ETH. <laughs> And he did my, the best service to tell me because he got my, you know, instinct, my surviving instinct to show that we could hire the Tom Hensingers, you know, at the time. And I think, th so there's this whole mixture of things th that allowed us to do. And last but not least, now, you have to have resources, okay? And, and something that we didn't realize, and I didn't realize, that we could do some serious fundraising uh, in the place where we were. So, so, so this is something new, and ETH also. And uh, maybe the last thing is the ERC. We also benefited from the ERC. And when I see the latest you know, thing that we're number three in Europe, even ahead of ETH, which is twice our size, uh, uh, makes me feel that you know, we are there. So, so you need this competition to some extent, and I think this is good. You need it maybe at the country level, but you also need it at the European level. But let's not forget that our real competitor is Asia and the US. And what we need is we need competition for this continent so that we are able you know, to survive and, and, and to thrive in this coming world that will be more and more 
competitive. And I think that's why I'm so adamant about having top elite, you know, European being research institutes and university. And to just to conclude, I think you need a couple of, you know, research institute. But what I'm telling him, you'd also need, you know, elite universities. Because if you have the problem of France having only, you know, the real elites on the CNRS and INSERM and so on, but you don't have the elite university, the country will not work as well. So, so, so I think, and where we have to find the balance is debatable. Okay. Competition was mentioned. Austria has a big neighbor. It's called Germany, not only in soccer. Uh, so the big neighbor of ICT Austria is the Max Planck Society, of course. It, uh, we constantly learn from it, but we also try to stay out of its shadow, which is a big shadow. Uh, are we being noticed in Munich? Well, <laughs> we, we notice every institute with excellent science. And uh, having said this, I want to add a point to what Helga has said, because that's one indicative element. ERC, by now, is not just a grant that supports early independency. It's a quality label. So what you've done is you've created an incentive to join a group of top European researchers at the junior level and at the senior level. So from this point of view, I think uh, this is something, and there are more indicators, uh, so top publications, of course, uh, that, that is something everybody notices, and uh, which is actually the, uh, the test at the end of the day whether you are successful. So the better your publications are, the better you will be recognized, and with a... A look at uh, our uh, political friends. I always like to quote a, a nice study from the United States in which the all patents, so I'm not talking about papers now, I'm talking about the patents that have been written in a period of about 10 give and take years. And these patents have been analyzed as uh, far as the uh, quotations are concerned, upon which the patent is based. So if you write something, of course, you have to refer to where your basic information stems from. And lo and behold, 75% of all publications cited are funded by public money. This was the first study. The second study pertaining to uh, what makes a research institute excellent is even more revealing. Because then they have looked, of these 75% of, of, of quotations, what was the range of excellency? So what was the range of quotations in the scientific community? And most of these papers belong to the 10%, so of the in, belong to the top group of papers quoted uh, in the scientific community. So what do we learn? You should invest, if you invest in research, you should invest in top research only. Mediocre research is not going to make it. And again, I can come up with a number, 27% uh, 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 of all papers being published worldwide are not quoted at all. So what you have done is actually very similar to the principle that Max Planck Society followed. You hire the best without compromise. You put a lot of weight onto the top science and onto an institution that then eventually, you're, you're still at the, the early age but at an institution that eventually will make a mark uh, in the scientific landscape. 
Uh, I just w want to add one or two more sentences. Uh, I'm, I'm fully with you, of course. There is not one or the other. There's place, there there is, a, is a need for both, being it a, a top university. And uh, to my mind, the biggest lack in Europe is that uh, we are not strong enough to differentiate, except for the Brits, the Swiss, maybe. Uh, this, is our, this is a big problem in the German university system. We, we do not differentiate well enough. You can't have eight hour teaching 150 students and then do top research. So you have to make a commitment to restructure university. In terms of uh, what Olaf said, creativity, I mentioned the creativity studies. I don't think I have to go into this. The most successful in, uh, organizations were research institute, and you are a physicist. You tell me what you feel the most important uh, or most influential research institute ever has been. It's the Bell Laboratories. So, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't think, you know, the creativity level, if, if that's what you were <laughs> meaning, is higher at university. I think it's always the same. It depends how you uh, foster it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rolf, uh, IST is a, is a very international institution. We have about 80% of our scientists on all levels, from students to professors, come from, from abroad, actually, are not Austrian. Now, it, it's very obvious that very expensive, big science like CERN must be an international effort. But uh, why should really a small country like Austria invest in an international institute for small science? Well, why not? <laughs> huh? Why not? Okay, yeah. You see, the politics is nodding. No, seriously, you heard the answers to some extent already from my left and from my right. I mean, first of all, it's a portal for Austria to go outside and also for others to come into Austria. And you should not forget to nowadays we are living in a global world. Why should you think only inside your boundaries, inside your borders? If you want to be excellent, you need the best brains. I mean, everybody uh, was talking about that. And they are not only in Austria. Sorry to say it like this, but it's true. Yeah, it's okay, okay. And they are not only in the Max Planck also. Okay. Okay. However, they are, they are everywhere, but you just have to have the best ones, yeah? And it doesn't matter if you are small or big. You have to be good. That's it. You have to be attractive. You have to be inspirational for the people to come to you. That's it. So the answer is definitely you should do it. Well, and continue beyond the 12 and beyond the 40 years. Okay, midlife crisis and whatever. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe, Olaf, what, what always strikes me as very special about ETH is that it's, it's uh, very uh, widely understood in Switzerland as being sort of critical to the, to the, to the, uh, uh, to the whole welfare of, of, of Swiss society and the state. And, you know, the proverbial taxi driver in, in Zurich knows about ETH and is proud about ETH. How... How do we get to such a situation in Austria? Um, maybe, maybe get new taxi drivers. <laughs> um, and also, if you say so, I, I of course, uh, I'd be flattered to believe it. Uh, but seriously, I mean, the, I, was, I was reading um, Edmund Phelps's book, Mass Flourishing, recently. And of course, he's very strong on innovation and tries to analyze how innovation can happen. And the point he's making is that all of society uh, has to be active in this process. It's not, it cannot be delegated to research institutes or to universities. And uh, so he, for instance, when he, he mentions uh, the times of, of Edison, you know, when 
uh, all these Yankees were so inventive and like to do things and, 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 and uh, so um, I think what we do well, and in particular our mechanical engineering department has done an excellent job in coming up with, uh, with uh, projects, student projects in the undergraduate curriculum, which breed enthusiasm of, uh, and this enthusiasm I think is then uh, carried outside the university. So we know that of course uh, from the history of our graduates, the Swiss machine industry, Swiss industry likes to hire graduates from, from, from both ATH because evidently they bring value to the institution. And I think they are also um, very good, the graduates, because they've been sort of trained in teams uh, in, in their, in their um, so, so they're very good also in incorporating others in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, um, uh, in the uh, employment situation where, where, they, where, where they wind up, you know. Uh, and then, of course, there's this very visible now, very strong uh, spin-off startup uh, scene. Um, and if you go to some of these places, it's, uh, they keep very close contact. I mean, Sonova or, or the Sensirium, for instance, company, which really one of the success stories of ETH Zurich, they keep very close contact with their alma mater for the simple reason that they look for new employees. In, in, and in a growth phase in which they are, of course, that's what you need, you need great employees. So um, I suppose this close, and which is reflected by the, by the of course, the respect that ADA commands, uh, this close interaction with society. I mean, we are not sitting on the moon, we are really in town, we have, uh, uh, Students coming not only from sort of the, uh, the very parochial uh, environment, but, but they're coming both, I mean, this is true for St. Gallen, for the, both ATHs and Fribourg for special reasons because it, they have two language education. Uh, so the ATHs are, are the non typical university in the sense that they're. Um, that they draw their students from a very much larger area than the conventional universities who tend to be. So, of course, then this spreads again as people go home, go out, and, and get employed. Um, one more fact that I would like to mention here is since a Swiss baccalaureate entitles you, apart from medicine, but in principle entitles you to anything you would like to study, it's really a market system. We can see on the entering students what they believe that their future employment will be like. I mean, the students or high school graduates normally select, well, okay, if they are basic scientists, maybe they really select for uh, uh, internal motivation, intrinsic, motiva intrinsic motivation. But the engineers, uh, very often, of course, a large percentage will select something where they feel this will give them a good job later on. Uh, so we've seen ups and downs uh, with, as the Swiss industry was, was flourishing, electric engineer, for instance, our, our enrollment dropped in the 90s after the IT crisis in 2001, computer science dropped in Zurich, it was more than half, and uh, I suppose same in Lausanne. Uh, mechanical engineer, which had dropped in the 80s, has resurged uh, to an amazing extent. I mean, and uh, I mean, right now, I, I suppose Switzerland, both ETHs are really a powerhouse in international robotics. Uh, Max Planck is uh, getting there <laughs> <laughs> and getting some inspiration also. <laughs> Sorry, I, I did this. <laughs> Not for ETH. <laughs> Not for ETH. Okay, let's, 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 it's a different story. <laughs> but, um, no, but, but I suppose, in essence, now this, of course, what can ISD Austria do? What can the, 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 the Austrian universities do? I mean, ISD does a lot to, to sort of have this contact with society, with all the, all the things you do, which, which are essential. Uh, but you have to get your graduates out, and they have to be in prominent positions. I think this will... This will Take some time. Uh, will take some time. Look at, look at Israel. Uh, um, 
Let's see, many of the yeah. managers come from Technion, I'm, I'm told, and the PhDs come from, from, yeah. from Weizmann. So, so, I mean, people look at where the graduates go, of course. So, get Thank your you. graduates out. Thank you. So, I, I, you know, in research, one has to uh, be flexible to change directions when, uh, when the situation changes. So, I'm, I'm going to take the liberty now to, to change the script here. I, I think looking at the time and knowing there's dinner waiting outside. Uh, I'll basically ask now Haim a final question. I'm, I'm sure the panelists are, will be available actually for questioning outside of, of, uh, afterwards. Uh, and Haim, if you please sort of wrap this into your conclusion here. Uh, it's, you know, the Weizmann Institute very clearly has been the role model for, for IST Austria, going back to this, very f to this report of 10, 10 years ago. And there's an enormous number of detail, of rules, of organizational structures of, uh, that we copied almost, you know, verbatim, um, uh, maybe adjusted to the Austrian context here and there from the Weizmann Institute. But what's the Weizmann is what makes the Weizmann Institute so special is not just the rules and the structures. It's it's this enormous loyalty one 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 immediately feels there on campus. The loyalty that the scientists, the other employees, also the supporters and donors have to the institution. So, uh, how do we copy this? How 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 do we how do we copy basically this atmosphere that breeds success? If you allow, Tom, I will merge my yeah. answer into some kind of a, a quick overview. Uh, I'll start from the end. I will not avoid the question that you just asked me, but I do not recommend to try to develop loyalty in IST Austria in the same method that we have done it, and I will explain why. What we have done is extremely positive but it cannot work elsewhere, but I will explain in a minute. I was sitting here and Tom said that dinner is waiting outside, but I was all the time thinking about food and not because I'm hungry. <laughs> I was thinking about a, a panel which is explaining how to produce fantastically good food. And the answer is it has to be presented very aesthetically it has to be tasty, it has to be nutritious, it has to be healthy, and it has to be yummy. And that is basically the formula, and that's what we've heard the whole evening about how to create a high-level scientific institute. And of course, if you go to prepare food with the formula that I just gave you, you will get nowhere. You need much more than that. Everything that we've heard from the extremely experienced and wise panel was correct. Truly, I, I cannot think of one sentence or one statement here that was not correct. On the other hand, none of this is correct in all cases and in all situations, and many of the colleagues here uh, mentioned it. So please allow me to touch on four quick points. What is excellence, fields of research, organization, and funding? In each one of them very briefly. Let's start with funding. For a good institute to be successful, funding has to be versatile. It has to come from several sources. That's the big, single, most important secret of the private American universities, and also of Oxford and Cambridge. Government support, private, philanthropy, research grants, industry, alumni, and a variety of other things. Only if you are versatile, you can reach the correct mix of success. Government funding, as done in most European universities, namely government funding which is covering the vast majority of the budget of the university, leads inevitably to some kind of egalitarianism and democracy. And Patrick was the one who mentioned twice or three times, and I strongly support it, science of quality cannot be democratic. 
quality is not a matter of democracy. You cannot take all these professors in an institution or in a university, some of which are fantastic, some of which are mediocre, and some of which are worthless, and give them the same resources in the name of democracy, and then let all of them vote equally who will be the president who will make those decisions. And that's why you will never find an American university in which the faculty is voting for the president. And that's what Patrick was saying again and again. And that's a very important secret of success. This is not a statement against democracy in general. It's a statement in the same way that you do not select the greatest musicians by democracy and you don't select the Olympic champions by democracy, but you let them compete. The same is true for science. And that is an incredibly important matter of governance and internal organization, but it emanates from the budget. Because if the government funds all the universities, it has to be more or less equal. The government is having a very big difficulty in saying University A is fantastic, University B is mediocre, University C should really be closed, but we politically cannot close it. Governments cannot say it. And then the result is that they give approximately the same amount of funding to all of them, and the result is average and mediocrity everywhere. And in that respect, it was a great miracle that the government of Austria decided to give preferential treatment to IST. Otherwise, this would never take off. And that incident happened before 060606. That funding was already promised, and now the funding for the second decade is a fantastic, brave decision for the government and, and, and we respect it uh, tremendously. In return for this funding, you have to return to the public. Now, we are sitting here in a place that used to be a mental hospital. I would like to recommend a certain type of schizophrenia for a scientific institute. It has to be as international as possible and as national as possible. International in the basic research. There is nothing Austrian or Swiss or Israeli or Japanese about basic research. Any new discovery in science is universal. That's truly international, should be done by people of all nations, should be done by their own international language. I mean, there's no question about it. But if you are supported generously by your taxpayers, you should give something back to your country or environment or region. And that can be done only in two ways. Education and touching the society. And when I say education, I mean from kindergarten to the age of 100 and everything in between, bringing science to the public, acquainting the public, exciting the public, explaining the importance of it, uh, changing the high school and junior high school and elementary school programs, helping the teachers, creating competitions, a hundred different things. And incidentally, at Weizmann, we have an enormously wide program of such things for 50 years now. That's one thing you return to society. The other thing you return to society is technology transfer, which leads to productivity, to export, to creating jobs, and that is the other thing that we have succeeded in doing at Weizmann in a tremendous way. We are the only basic research institute in the world which earns every year more royalty than its entire budget. I mean, there is no other such place, and we were partly lucky to do so, but we were also partly uh, uh, successful in one way or another. I mean, every year the, the total income from royalties alone is larger than the entire budget of the Institute. And we are not spending it. We are putting it into an endowment to guarantee our future because three years from now we may not make that kind of money, or ten years from now. So to go back to the funding, it has to be versatile, it has to come from many sources. Only this can really guarantee the, the correct uh, governance. And there has to be a balance between the dominance of the chief executive, the president, and the opinion of the faculty. The independent researcher has to be completely independent. He or she should be able to do more or less what they want within their own budget. It's not that the president gives them order, but somebody has to make the difficult decisions. The other thing which, which has to be uh, touched upon, and that relates to the question why 
Okinawa and, and Kloster Neuburg suddenly chose the same way. And, and why Weizmann, in some sense, was a model. Weizmann was one of the few places which put all the different fields of science in one campus. Most research institutes in Europe, the good ones, the excellent ones, and the mediocre ones, are devoted to one specific subject. And the emergence of so many connections between different fields, such as the example that was given by, by Jonathan Dorfan, brain research and computer science, uh, robotic, understanding vision, all, all of these things which are halfway in biology and halfway in computer science and there's a lot of physics and chemistry interfering, that cannot be done without having people from all of this discipline talking to each other literally every day. So the formula of having all the fields in one campus was kind of self-evident. The second formula, which has always been the wish of all research institutes, is to have PhD students as part of the organization and degrees of PhD given by the institute. And that, these were the two fundamentals, and these were the two things which unite Okinawa and, and, uh, and, and the IST. And being a research institute primarily means no undergraduates or very few undergraduates. In the case of these two, no undergraduates. Uh, one word that was not discussed here is choosing fields of science. And I think that here there is no formula, but there is a map. And I like to think about the map of world science, which cannot be drawn on a piece of paper because it's not two-dimensional. You imagine the land of biology, and it is divided into various provinces, which overlap and touch, and each one of them is touching most of the others, but not all the others. And then there is the land of chemistry, which is half occupied by the physicists and half occupied by the biologists, but is really an independent land. And then there is the land of computer science, which is a whole subject by itself, but then it touches on a hundred other things. And then there's the land of engineering. And they're all touching this way and the other way. And in every one of them, there are also niches which are far remote from all the others. My own scientific field, theoretical particle physics, is one of the most remote from any, anything else, except for mathematics. But there are other fields, like we mentioned a minute ago, brain research, but uh, structural biology, the structure of complex uh, biological molecules, and you name it, there are hundreds of fields which are having a foot in every direction. And an institute should go after the best people, not after the best fields, but in going after the best people, this multidimensional map of the world of science should be in front of your eyes, and you should populate it in such a way that there will be no big lands with deserts. Small deserts are allowed, small vacant places are allowed, strong connections here and there are fantastic, but that's how you should look at it. And it's difficult to explain it. You have to feel it and you have to have the, the intuition. And finally, when you evaluate, and this has to do with ERC and with EPFL and with Max Planck and with ETH, when, when you evaluate how good an institution is, I claim that there are three different measures. One is judge it by the top people. Every institute will send its top ten people. Let's see who is the best. That's very important criteria. A second, compare the average. Each institute presents the average quality of its people. That's not the same, because there could be a huge university with 10 fantastic Nobel laureates, and next to it, a small place whose 10 best people is the are the same level. But the university also has maybe 500 mediocre professors, and the other places only 20 others, and there are none of them are mediocre. 
So the average is also important. And finally, and that is applying to, to the institutions we are talking about and to ERC grant, there is the threshold. In other words, now there's another competition. Every institution chooses his worst person and sends it to the competition. And the one whose worst person is the best, it means that it has the highest threshold of admission to the research family of the institute. And that's a very important criteria. Another way of saying it, you are the president of the institute. You can fire overnight without any damage any tenured professor. How many of your professors would you like to fire? If you have 500 professors and you would like to fire 200 of them under these circumstances, not good. If you have 200, which was my case when I was president of Weizmann, and I asked myself this question every two or three years, and I never could get more than five or 10 people that I would like to fire out of the 200 professors, tenured professors, I was very proud of it. Because Weizmann is not as good as Max Planck on the top 10 people, but Weizmann has a very, very high threshold. And the result of this is a huge percentage of ERC grants. Because the ERC grants don't go to the top five people of every institution. They go to the very good people. And that's how more than 50% of IST Austria gets uh, ERC grants. Because IST Austria has already a very, very high threshold uh, of, of admission as to, to the faculty. And that's an extremely important parameter. It's not the only one. Of course, having the top 10 people, fantastic people, is extremely important. But you should always look at all the angles. Your top people, your threshold, and your output. So that's, in a nutshell, a few views and a few emphasis on what was said here. And to answer the first question about Weizmann Institute, the Weizmann Institute is a very special situation. We are paying our professors much less than any European or American university of civil authority. Please take the microphone. We are, we are paying our professors much less, much smaller salary than any American or European university of, of comparable quality. And as a result, they are passing a negative test. They are coming to us only if their first priority is to live in Israel, to have to go their family in Israel. We have 500 postdocs from all over the world, but they are coming for two, three, four, five years. The tenure faculty is 95% Israelis, and they pass their own self-imposed selection that are willing to give up a lot of material advantage in order to live where they want to live. And once you are like that, and the institute itself has a family atmosphere, uh, people are staying there for a long time and they're loyal to, to, to the tasks. And also it's a campus very much like this campus, a green campus away from the main city. The moment you walk through the gate in the morning, you feel like you have come to another world. That creates a certain affinity. And I'm proud to say that even now I live on the campus, we live on the campus, and when one of the electricians or, or, or the air conditioning technicians come to fix something, you feel the love that they have to the institute and, and the appreciation they have to the scientists. So we don't need a proverbial taxi driver, we, need, we have proverbial electricians, <laughs> and uh, it works magnificently. But, I don't recommend to IST Austria to reduce the salaries in order to, <laughs> have, to have this kind of test. And I also don't recommend IST Austria to live in a country which is always on the verge of war and surrounded by so many problems. Learn from the Weizmann Institute all the good things and leave the rest of it. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll, I'll just want to thank all the panelists again, and Stefan will. Yeah, uh, I, I, I do some closing, but it's very short. Uh, I'd like to thank all panelists. It was like a lecture to me, writing as fast as possible, losing a lot of content, but knowing that it has been recorded, so I'm on the lucky side. Thank you very much for that. And the only thing that I have to say now is that I'm the only person between you 
and the buffet. And that means um, that I say thank you to all of you coming here today. Have a nice evening, enjoy the time, and enjoy the buffet outside. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.